Welcome into the evening devotional time with the Pickerington Church of Christ. We encourage you to find additional resources on our website at pickeringtonchurch.org slash at home resources. So grab your Bibles and let's enjoy some time in the Word. Our scripture reading is John chapter 16 verses 4 through 15. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Hey everyone, welcome in. I'm so glad you're joining us. We're coming back to John chapter 16 tonight after taking a week off last week to do a song devotional. And our main goal is we've been studying in the upper room and Jesus with his disciples in John 13, 14, 15, and 16 is to have created within us what was created in those 11. After Jesus spent that night with them, there were things that were said, things that were understood, that created an unbreakable bond between Jesus and these disciples. A bond that had the ability to transcend time, transcend space, and endure great difficulties. And that's what we want to be able to do is create an unbreakable relationship with Jesus. In verse 7, Jesus says something almost unbelievable. He says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Now, how could it be to the advantage of the disciples and even us in our relationship with Jesus if he's not going to be here with us? Well, he says, I'm going to send somebody to you, the helper, the spirit of truth. And it will be a greater advantage to you to have the spirit in you than just me beside you. The ministry of the Holy Spirit to disciples of Jesus is essential in our relationship with Christ, in our walk of faith. And it's a ministry that we don't always talk very much about. It's one that I think I've heard from several people they don't understand too well. So tonight what I want to do is give you a little bit of an overview from Scripture about what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is. This isn't going to be exhaustive, so I'm going to encourage you to do your own study. If you have questions, you can always contact me and let me know, and we'll try to work through some of those. But I'm going to give you a few scriptures. I'm going to try to trace a little bit of an overview to help alleviate some of our fears about the teaching about the Holy Spirit, what he does or who he is or how he works. Um, It feels kind of strange to us. And so I want to try to walk through a little bit of those details tonight and help you understand that. So maybe we can uh, have a better understanding of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let's start, first of all, with answering the question of who he is. Now, you notice Jesus says several times when referring to the Spirit, him or he, over and over he says this. And that is because the Holy Spirit is not an it, but a him. He's not a what, but a who. He's not just some inanimate force or some random energy in the world. He is an actual being spoken of in Scripture just like the Father is spoken of and just like the Son is spoken of with regards to being God. Some scriptures you might want to look into are maybe like Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, Psalm 139, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. These are just a few that speak about the nature of who the Holy Spirit is. So I want to first encourage you not to view the Holy Spirit as some it or some thing but actually begin to see him just like you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as a who, not a what. 
So the second question is really where we get into the meat of it. What does he do? Now I'm going to touch on some specifics here in just a moment, but I want to point out one thing. These guys that Jesus was talking to this night in John chapter 16 were immature, self-interested cowards for the most part. After Jesus ascends, these guys go from being these cowards to this mighty force. Now that's not because they went to some Zig Ziglar or Tony Robbins event and they got all inspired. This was because Jesus gave them the Holy Spirit. The Bible reveals that the Holy Spirit has a ministry to believers, to the disciples of Jesus. It says, let me give you a few examples. John chapter 14, verse 16 says that he is the presence of God with us. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16 say that he testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. He tells us and reminds us that we are the children of God. Again, in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, it's the Spirit who intercedes for you when you don't know how to pray or what to pray for. In Ephesians 1, he tells us that the Spirit is our seal of eternal salvation, and he is the deposit of the Father in us for heaven. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In Romans chapter 8, again, in verse 13, it tells us that he is the one who leads us into war against our sin to find victory over the enemy. And you know, Paul points this out in a couple different places, that it's the Holy Spirit who empowers us to know that we are loved by God. Being loved by God and knowing and being confident that we're loved by God is almost an impossible task for any human being. That's why Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, prays for the Ephesians believers. And he says that he wants the Spirit to strengthen them in the inner man so that they could comprehend the love of Jesus. It takes the strength from the Spirit to be able to know that you're loved. Again, that's why Paul would say in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that it's the Holy Spirit who pours out the love of God into our hearts. So these are a few things generically from Scripture that is revealed to us about what the Holy Spirit does for us as disciples of Jesus. Now in our text, Jesus gives us three specific things that the Holy Spirit does for us that's crucial for us to understand. You know, most people think the Holy Spirit is just this um, being within us that makes us feel guilty for all the wrong things we do. It's like he's um, an animated conscience, so to speak, just reminding us when we make mistakes. But if you notice here what Jesus says in verses 8 through 11, the Holy Spirit's role is much greater and much different than that. In verse 8, it says this, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Let's walk through these three things specifically that Jesus says to make sure that we understand them. Now, the first one there in verse 9 says that he convicts the world of sin because they do not believe in him. Now, let's notice a couple things. First of all, he convicts the world. This is when John is talking about those outside of fellowship with God. And he says the conviction of sin comes to those outside of the fellowship with God. And the word sin is singular. It's a generic sin. It's a generic term. And what he's talking about is for their lack of belief in Jesus as the Savior. You see, the Holy Spirit is the convicting agent to those in the world that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, if you already are a disciple, this is actually really good news when it comes to sharing your faith because this means that evangelism is not a pressure-packed situation for you. You and I as disciples have just been called to communicate about the gospel. We're actually not the agent of conviction. So we can leave that to the Holy Spirit and let Him do that work while we just be presenters of the truth of God's word. So the first thing is he convicts the world of sin because they don't believe in Jesus. Now notice again in verse 10 how Jesus 
explains this. He says, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you won't see me anymore. Now, what does this mean? How does he convict us of righteousness because he's going to the Father? Does this mean that the Holy Spirit is just the sensation inside of us that always reminds us that we're not righteous enough? That's actually not what he's saying at all. What does Jesus mean when he says, because I go to the Father? After Jesus died, was buried, resurrected, spent 40 days on earth, then he ascended back to the Father. We have to ask ourselves, what is Jesus doing at the right hand of the Father now that has to do with righteousness? And how does the Holy Spirit convince us of that? Well, it tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, meaning he is the answer, the solution for our sins. And he's now at the right hand of the Father, and he says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, that he is our advocate with the Father, our defense attorney, meaning this that Jesus day and night is at the right hand of the Father advocating for you. Yes, he's saying to the Father, hey, he is one of mine. Hey, she is one of mine. Hey, they have put all their faith in my work, in my work at the cross and in my perfect life, and they have my righteousness now, Father. They trust me. They have been baptized into me, and they have died to them old, their old self, and they've raised to walk in the newness of life. Over and over, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father saying, hey, that disciple, hey, that person, they're one that belongs to me. And the Holy Spirit is convicting us of righteousness. Not righteousness that we create, that we are not able to do, but he's constantly reminding us that Jesus at the right hand of the Father is advocating for us with a righteousness that belongs to him and not to us. So one of the great works of the Holy Spirit is that he reminds us that we are righteous because of Jesus, not because of our own works. Now notice the third one. He said he convicts us of righteousness, but also concerning judgment. Again, look at the explanation. He says concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now just like the second one, righteousness, the Holy Spirit is not this um, feeling inside of us that always warns us about judgment. His role is not just to hang judgment over your head like some warning saying, you better be good or you're going to get judged. That's not what he does. Read it again. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is already judged. He is reminding us that our enemy is defeated already, that he has lost the war, that our enemy is doomed for eternal destruction. So all the time that we feel afraid of Satan or we give in sometimes and we get defeated, he's constantly coming back around to remind us that that enemy, Satan, is already judged and he is sentenced to eternal death. So how do you know the conviction you're experiencing is actually from the Holy Spirit? Well, verse 14 tells us, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will glorify him. That means that he makes a big deal out of Jesus, that Jesus is the most important message to the Holy Spirit. So if you are living constantly under this weight of guilt and shame, always under conviction, but never brought to the cross to see who Jesus is, it's not from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin in light of Jesus and guides us to the cross to see the forgiveness of Jesus. He does both. And in doing so, he leads us to confession, to repentance, to transformation, and ultimately gratitude. He takes us through that whole process because of the greatness of Jesus. Listen how he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, And such were some of you, this people lost in sin. He says, but you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So how does he do it? That's really the question I get a lot of times is, how does the Spirit actually do this? Well, it's actually kind of simple. It's not 
some mystical experience. The Holy Spirit is not some magical silver bullet that just all of a sudden fixes everything. If you go back in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul walks us through the armor of God that we need to wear as we live in this life battling a spiritual battle. And at the end of that passage, when he's telling us about the different pieces of the armor, he says to the Christian, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is the sword that the Spirit uses to defeat the enemy and transform our life. The Word of God is the mighty sword that defeats our enemies and transforms our life. It is a powerful weapon that can be used to defeat an enemy, but also a precise scalpel that can cut out all the things in our life that shouldn't be there. That's how it defeats enemies and transforms our life. The Word of God is that powerful. But if you read carefully in Ephesians 6, he says the sword belongs to the Spirit. So as you dig into the Word, as you read it constantly, as you feed in the Word of God, what you're doing is supplying the Holy Spirit with the sword to do the work that He has promised to do, all the ones that I've referenced and so many more. If you don't get into the Word, if you don't spend time in the Word and read the Word and and, um, use the Word, you are quenching the Spirit, like Paul would say, and not allowing the Spirit to work in your life. So if you want the Spirit to do all the things that He's promised that He'll do, you've got to give Him the sword to work with, which is the Word of God. You've got to be feeding on the Word of God and reading it regularly. So let me answer the last question. How do we get Him in our life? Let's go back to our beloved verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Such a powerful, pivotal moment in the Christian story. There Peter preached to the very first converts to Christianity. And when they were under conviction of sin, when Peter was preaching about the gospel, they said, what shall we do? And Peter said to them in chapter 2, verse 38, repent, which means turn back to God, and be baptized for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, the gift that we receive in baptism is actually not forgiveness. Forgiveness is what paves the way for the gift. You see, when you are baptized into Christ, you are forgiven, washed clean of all your sins. But what that's doing is preparing you as a vessel to be able to receive the gift. That he said in Acts chapter 2, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is why baptism is so sacred for us. It is where you are united with Christ, and the old self dies, and you're able to raise to a new life with the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in you. You see, baptism is so much more than just some ceremonial religious washing. Like in Acts chapter 19, they were baptized into the baptism of John for the remission of their sins, for forgiveness, but they didn't receive the Holy Spirit. See, baptism is more than just some rite or ritual that you do to enter into the church. Baptism is a place where you are forgiven. It is the place where you are brought into the body, but it is also the place where you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Receiving the Holy Spirit is a matter of submission, and surrender to Jesus. It's a matter of humility and being aware of your need. It's a matter of being committed and ready to follow. It's a matter of repentance and turning back to God. And it's a matter of being baptized into Jesus Christ so that those sins could be forgiven and you become finally a vessel that can have God fully in your life again. That's why we encourage you, if you have not yet been baptized into Jesus Christ, There is no better time to do it than right now. You don't get baptized when you are perfect. You don't wait to get your life all cleaned up and then you come and present yourself as some person who's ready to enter into the church. That's not how it works. It's when you recognize that you need the forgiveness of God so you can have the presence of God in your life so that you can begin to allow Him to take all the work that you're doing and reading the Word and begin to work on you, defeating your enemies and changing your life. 
the Holy Spirit has promised to do wonderful things for the disciple. But you and I must be participants in that. He doesn't just show up and do it on his own accord without us being willing participants. You and I must receive him and we must supply him with the sword to let him do his work. And we must learn to ask him to do the things that he has promised to do for us. I hope that this has helped you begin your study and understanding what the Holy Spirit can do for a disciple of Jesus. And I hope you can see how his ministry and his role in our life is essential for us to have a healthy, enduring relationship with Jesus. If there's any way we can help you develop and build that relationship with Christ, please just let us know.